to be part of the Evergreen Podcast Network. Thank you for being here. In the F grade, we have random thoughts about philosophers. And unfortunately, this is very popular and quite readily accessible. It's easily found pretty much everywhere. All right. How about at the D level, we find people who put together tier lists about philosophers. At the C level, we have philosophy is therapeutic. And I think it's right. C is the first, you know, competently passing grade, it seems to me. And so here we have a lot of people who are drawn to philosophy because it's therapeutic for them. And I like the idea that philosophy is therapeutic. At one point in time, I really liked the idea that philosophy is therapeutic. But with all of these distinctions being leveled nowadays in postmodernity, I feel as though even though philosophy is therapeutic and I'm happy that many people find it therapeutic, I personally find it therapeutic as well. I do think, though, there is more to philosophy than just the sense in which studying philosophy may seem therapeutic for you. So with this next level at the B level, we can ask the question, why is one philosophy better than another philosophy? And I feel like this is when you are truly doing philosophy. You are asking questions like, should I believe this philosophy? Should I believe this philosophy? Is this the right way to think about something? Or is this a better way to think about something? So that's why I have this at the B level. Next at the A level, I really like this. This has been a part of my bio, the way I conclude my bio now for a number of years. And basically this idea that I want to see what they saw. So you take these great philosophers like Plato and Aristotle and Kant, and you ask yourself, whenever they think about human experience, whenever they think about reality, what were they thinking? What was it that they envisioned? And I want to be able to envision reality the way that they were envisioning reality. So I think that that is excellent philosophy. I think that is high level philosophy. I think that if you are motivated in that way, that you are on the right path. And so I think that that is good. Next at the S level, and again, my I'm adopting these tier lists. This isn't necessarily how I would approach it. This is the video game approach to tier lists. So at the S level, which is supposed to be the top level here above the A level, the question that I am asking to identify what is philosophy at this level, that question is what paradigms and methods are in play? And I want to really sort of point out why I chose this language. First off, if we can see philosophy in terms of paradigms and methods, then we really have a high point of view from which to look at the content that we are considering philosophy. It's also the case that at that level, and I think that this is in essence the way that Plato and Aristotle and Kant envisioned philosophy. We're seeing what they saw. At that level, we could think of these paradigms and methods as, as being in play. So you have just this array of paradigms and methods in play with one another. And given their limitations, given the identification of one paradigm as opposed to another paradigm, there is a sense in which they interact with each other according to rules. And so being able to see that is to is being able to think about the paradigms and the methods at a very high level. So you can see in a sense, this is like taking the 
B level and being able to treat it at the level of a science. And so I really do think that this is the highest tier level identification in regard to the question, what is philosophy? Ever heard of Stoicism? Chances are, if you have, you've heard of Stoicism with a lowercase s and not Stoicism with an uppercase s. Lone wolves, no emotions, antisocial behavior, cold, indifference, all that is Stoicism with a lowercase s. Stoicism with an uppercase s is the ancient Greek philosophy and virtue ethics framework that centers on service to the cosmopolis, to include your family, friends, community, and planet, and the development of a good moral character. My name is Tanner Campbell, and I'm the host of Practical Stoicism, a a three-times-a-week podcast teaching Stoic principles and concepts to anyone interested through the exploration of texts and deep dives into various moral topics. You can find Practical Stoicism where you're already listening to podcasts by searching for Practical Stoicism or by going to stoicismpod.com. I invite you to give it a listen today. You just might like it. One of the things that we want to make sure that we avoid, and this has been a consistent theme throughout pretty much all of the presentations regarding postmodernism, is that we do not want to confuse popularity with truth. Just because something is popular, and there are many things that are referred to as philosophy that are very popular, despite their popularity, they are incoherent or they do not understand above the C tier list level here. And so it's very important for us to not confuse popularity with truth. And truth, when we talk about this tier list, truth is at especially the level, the, the top level of the tiers. So for example, when we are looking at the way in which paradigms and methods play with one another. There is a sense in which then we can ask ourselves questions about these interactions and truth governs those those questions. Truth governs those interactions, not popularity. I believe that at the highest tier list level, when one asks what is philosophy, I think that many of the answers that have been floating around, many of the answers that you can find on the internet Many of the answers that are being taught in the university, I think that they are inadequate. And the reason that they are inadequate is because they don't recognize their own history. They don't recognize the trajectory that these concepts have been on. And so what I've found in tracing back these ideas, so for example, you have all these analytic philosophers, which is clearly the most popular kind of philosophy at the university level. And lastly, I want to say one more thing about this tier list is that the American Philosophical Association, for example, and many, many academics nowadays, these postmodern academics, they seem to believe, or they certainly seem to claim that they believe. And in fact, I Unfortunately, I found myself on the American Philosophical Association's website today and all of the articles that they were advertising on the page that I landed on were actually proponents of what I'm about to criticize. So this idea that, and, I, and I've seen this in many other places and I, I continue to see this, right? This idea that um, we don't like what this philosopher did uh, in their free time, or we don't like uh, what this philosopher used to eat for dinner, or we don't like this philosopher's beliefs about something, which really is not very far away from we don't like this philosopher's ethnicity. Uh, but in either case, uh, we don't like these personal things about these philosophers. And so therefore, we don't think that they should be taught. Right. And I saw a, a tier list that I was looking at. And I suppose in some ways it inspired me to put this tier list together. But when I saw this tier list, they said that 
Immanuel Kant was not a great philosopher because he was racist. And I was, I was dumbfounded to, to hear that. I was dumbfounded to see it. And this is again, was on a video that had, you know, over a million views. And in the comment section, you have all these people cheering the content creator on, telling them, hey, this is great stuff. Keep it coming. You know, this is so great. You're teaching me philosophy. Thank you so much. And yet what's passing for philosophy in this presentation, in this tier list, is something like, well, it's, it's psychologistic, right? It is the lunatic fallacy, for example. It is ad hominem. It is a version of the, the genetic fallacy. These are all logical fallacies, right? So it's, these are all thinking errors. And they're saying that, I mean, to, to think that Immanuel Kant isn't one of the greatest philosophers of all time. I made a comment uh, on this tier list video and I said, hey, Plato, Aristotle and Kant they're always in the running for the greatest philosopher of all time. And anyone, and I stand by this, anyone who thinks otherwise does not know what they're talking about. It's just that simple. It doesn't matter if they get a million views. It doesn't matter if they get six million views. It doesn't matter if they get nine million views. They don't know what they're talking about. So I think it's important to say that. I think it's important to put that out there. I mean, we don't want to indulge these thinking errors. One of the ways in which this has come about is the idea that, so there's a, there's a, there's a trajectory here, right? So the initial stage is a person comes into contact with something that's being called philosophy and they say, Hey, I, I really like this. I enjoy this. Uh, I enjoy the experience of this. Then they start to investigate it a little bit further. And as they begin to investigate it a little bit further, they find that there are things that they don't like about it. And then they say, well, you know, I'm just going to do this and not include the things that I don't like about it. That is a very wrong and a very incorrect and a very bad idea. So we need to ask ourselves, what really is philosophy? Not ask ourselves, what do we like and what do we want to include in the category of philosophy? Briefly, I would like to remind us of this categorization of philosophy. I think that this is very helpful for those who find their activities near the bottom of the tier list. It may be very helpful for them to adopt this language. It may be very helpful for them to adopt this categorization and the logic that follows along with it. So for example, I have retraced the history of some of the terms that are being used nowadays. And I've asked myself, you know, as these, these terms evolved, was there a previous term or was there a previous understanding that may be better? I mean, did we lose something in the transition from some of these terms? from pre-modern to modern to post-modern philosophy, for example. And I believe that we have. And so therefore, I tried to put this together as a very fast way to think about the whole of philosophy. And so here we have that we can distinguish between philosophy in general and philosophy in particular. And when we look at philosophy in general, we have these three major categories. I don't like the term meta philosophy. I've never liked the term meta philosophy. Uh, I think that philosophy is sufficient. We don't need meta philosophy. But I suppose if you like the term meta philosophy, that this could be understood as a kind of meta philosophical characterization of philosophy. But for me, I just think this is the way to understand philosophy when you divide it up into philosophy in general and philosophy in particular. So philosophy in general then divides into soteriology, criteriology, and ontology. Inside of soteriology, you find ethics, for example. And inside of criteriology, you find epistemology, for example. So try that on for size and see what you think. Take it, take it for a spin and see how it drives. I think that what you'll find is that it 
very much helps organize your thinking. Uh, it's also the case that methodology, for example, falls into the category of criteriology. And so with this architectonic, as I refer to it, with this architectonic of philosophy, of course, coming from one of the greatest philosophers of all time, Immanuel Kant, with this architectonic of philosophy, it becomes possible for you to think about the paradigms and the methods that are in play in whatever philosophy it is that you're looking at. So first and foremost, we can ask ourselves, okay, what are the soteriological elements of this philosophy? What are the criteriological elements of this philosophy? What are the ontological elements of this philosophy? And then lastly here, when we look at philosophy in particular, we're looking at the actual history of philosophy. So when we're looking at the actual history of philosophy, then we can use these categories of philosophy in general to help us understand and trace trajectories from out of and through the history of philosophy. So I think that this is very valuable stuff. I've got short videos, they're the first three videos that I made on this channel. I have short videos explaining each one of these categories of philosophy in general, soteriology, criteriology, ontology, and I also put together a video on the fractal view of the history of philosophy, which refers to the, the final fourth piece here in the architectonic of philosophy. I hope that this was enjoyable for you. I hope it provoked some interesting thoughts for you, and I hope you find the distinctions in this presentation to be helpful. All right, we are selling books on Amazon, courses on Gumroad, hosting videos on YouTube, and memes on X. And if you'd like to see the philosophy themes in puzzle form, check us out on Instagram. As always, I welcome your questions and comments on YouTube. Thank you for sharing and supporting this open access educational podcast. This is Mark. And this is Wes. We'd like to tell you about Close Reads. A philosophy podcast where we comment on philosophy texts in real time. We give you the experience of reading very difficult verbiage without you having to actually do that. We cover the big names and the figures you've always wanted to know more about. And share our insights from 15 years running the Partially Examined Life podcast downloaded over 50 million times. Join us on Close Reads.